Hello and welcome to the final part of the final lecture on this course on chemical process design. In the, this part of this lecture we're going to examine another use of electricity which is electrochemical processing. We'll start by highlighting two electrochemical processes that are very large global consumers of electrical power before going on to examine a case study of a chemical site that has electrochemistry at its very core. Now there are many electrochemical processes in use today. I've cherry-picked two because they happen to be very, very large consumers of electricity, which is what I want to demonstrate. So the first of these electrical chemical processes is aluminium smelting. Now, aluminium is reduced from its ore bauxite into elemental aluminium in an electrolytic process. And a global scale plant will produce roughly one and three quarter million tonnes of aluminium per year. And that global scale plant will require between two and a half and three gigawatts of electrical power to operate. Now let me put that electrical load into some kind of context. The largest gas fired power station in the UK at the moment is around two and a half gigawatts. The total combined generation of biomass in the UK today is three gigawatts. A large nuclear plant in the UK is about 1.2 gigawatts. So a global scale aluminium smelter needs one or possibly even two very large power stations in order to operate. And so you'll only find these aluminium smelters in places where electricity is very, very inexpensive. There is one aluminium smelter left in the United Kingdom today. It's not a global scale plant anymore. It produces only 42,000 tonnes a year of aluminium. It requires 65 megawatts of electricity, and that electricity is sourced from hydropower. You will find this smelter near Fort William in Scotland, and it's been in existence for nearly 100 years. Many different metals are produced by electrochemical processes, for example, copper, sodium and lead. However, there's one other thing that is produced in a very large scale by very high power electrochemical processes, and that is chlorine. Chlorine is produced from solutions of sodium chloride, produced in an electrolytic process where chlorine is oxidized to give chlorine gas, hydrogen ions are reduced to give elemental hydrogen, and again a world scale plant would produce about 1.6 million tonnes per year of chlorine, requiring between 1.6 and 2 gigawatts of electrical power. Again, this is going to be one large size power station or two smaller size power stations in order to supply that amount of electricity. A very, very electrically intensive process. So I'd like to focus on chlorine production a little bit, firstly because it's quite personal to me. I used to work on large chloralkali site, and also because they're a very, very good example of sites with a very, very large electrical power demand. So if you look back in history, chlorine was first manufactured using something called flowing mercury cells. They were called Kastner cells. The diagram on my whiteboard is an excerpt from Kastner's original patent. What you have is a solution of sodium chloride, you have um, carbon electrodes as your cathode, and you have flowing mercury as your anode. And the sodium amalgamates with the mercury to form a sodium mercury amalgam, and then that sodium mercury amalgam is then processed to give you sodium hydroxide or caustic soda, and chlorine bubbles off on the electrodes. So chlorine production by use of mercury cells was finally phased out in Europe in 2020. Um, all through the 90s, new technology was being pioneered, and these were primarily membrane-based electrochemistry, electrochemical cells, where you have a membrane that is selectively permeable to certain ions, where you don't need any longer this flowing mercury electrode. And so these are far more environmentally benign compared to the old mercury-powered processes. So I'd like to talk a little bit about a chloralkali site that you'll find in the UK and it was started life in 1895 as the Kastner Kellner Alkali Company and it's in the northwest of the UK in Cheshire in a town called Runcorn and let me show you where Runcorn is on my map here Runcorn is the town highlighted with the red circle so let's just zoom in as to why you find a big chloralkali site in Runcorn and the green area I've shaded on this map is the remains of a dried out seabed from the Triassic era so this is in the Cheshire Plain, and about 200 metres down in the Cheshire Plain, you find vast, vast reserves of rock salt, which is the remains of this dried out sea. So this rock salt is extracted, usually by hot water, and piped as brine 
into these processing plants. Now, the site in Runcorn has got a very long history. It was taken over in the 1920s by a company called Brunner Monden Company. And then Brunner Mond was absorbed into another company called Imperial Chemical Industries, or ICI, when it was formed in 1926. ICI was dissolved in the early 2000s. INEOS then purchased the ICI chlorine assets at Runcorn. And then this was since acquired by another company called Vinova in 2015. Now, the peak capacity of the Runcorn site prior to mercury cell phase out was very large. It was 720,000 tonnes per year of chlorine, 830,000 tonnes per year of caustic soda. The current capacity, now that the mercury cells have gone, is 430,000 tonnes per year of chlorine and 500,000 tonnes per year of caustic soda. So let's have a little look at the site and what you'll see is that you have basically a cascade design. You've got your chlorine cell rooms producing chlorine and caustic soda and you've got about 15 or so plants downstream of that producing things such as solvents, refrigerants, pesticides and polymers. And at its peak, the site required about 440 megawatts of electrical power, which was more than the city of Liverpool nearby. And at that point, it was about 1% of the UK power grid. And so the big challenge that you have with electrochemical sites is how do you supply reliably and cost effectively this very large amount of power? So let's zoom in and look at a few places that you'll find power plant on a site such as this. So. Firstly, at the northern end of site, you have your chlorine cell rooms. So they require about 440 megawatts. They run off DC, of course, and the DC level is about 2 to 3 volts. So there are many, many thousands of amps that correspond to 440 megawatts at the 2 to 3 volts DC. Nearby, in fact, right next door to these chlorine cell rooms, you'll find a power station. So the old Western Point power station was commissioned in the 1920s. It was a coal fire power station. It was a combined heat and power plant, since it also provided steam to this site, and it had a capacity of about 100 megawatts. That power plant has now long since been decommissioned. In the 1970s, Another combined heat and power plant was built on this site. The p demand for power was so large and the demand for steam was so large that the Western Point power plant was no longer enough. The Weaver combined heat and power plant supplied 50 megawatts of electrical power and steam to site. So let's just have a look at what the on-site generation was and what the grid requirement was. So the on-site generation up until the early 1990s was about 150 megawatts electrical which meant that 290 megawatts of balance of the power supply had to be imported from the grid. Now, it must be noted that the supply to the critical machines on this site was sourced from a different part of the grid, such that if the main power supply ever failed, critical bits of equipment, such as chlorine scrubbers, still continued to work. The key challenge that this site faced was power pricing. Power pricing was inherently volatile. If, for example, you look in 2001, the price of one megawatt of electricity was between £10 and £59. So the average price was about £19 per megawatt hour. So the import bill for power for this site was of order roughly £50 million per year, which is a very large number indeed. It doesn't take many years before it would be far cheaper to build another power station on site. In the 1980s, planning permission was put in for a nuclear power plant on this site, but that was refused. But in the late 90s, a contractor supply was entered with a company called Intergen, who built an 800 megawatt combined cycle gas turbine at the eastern end of the site. This was the Rock Savage power plant. It exists to this day. And that provides the balance of power to the chlorine cell rooms and exports the rest of the power out onto the national grid. So let's summarise a few key points. There are many electrochemical processes in operation, some of which are present as very, very large electrical loads. And specifically, we talked about aluminium smelting and about chlorine production. The chlorine production site in Runcorn is one of the largest single consumers of electrical energy in the UK. Large electrochemical sites may have multiple power stations to provide them with both electricity and steam. And very often, these large sites will also have a critical machine supply that is sourced from a different part of the power grid compared to its main supply.